Good morning, folks. Everything new under the sun. Now, this is a, this video is a, a repeat, a repost of a video I did uh, two years ago, and I think it re I think it's uh, should get some more attention here. And it has to do with Kent Hovind's "What on Earth is About to Happen" uh, book that he put out. This specific segment of it, I was going through uh, the book and looking at uh, the what he thinks about the Dead Sea being restored, the peace treaty that's to come two things that happened before the day of the Lord, and then speaking of the third temple. So a lot of detail is covered here um, in Kent Hovind's What on Earth book. So I want to repost this. Um, I should uh, make some a new set of videos about this, but I think it's important nonetheless. The information is good, um, and now that there's more subscribers, I think there's a, a large audience that would be interested in this. And if you'd like me to do uh, a new uh, refreshed video on this let me know um, and, we, and we can take a look at doing that again I think it would be interesting and uh, Ken Hovind has some uh, very interesting ideas he also happens to be one um, that uh, does believe also uh, or or uh, uh, thinks that uh, 2028 uh, is uh, a very very interesting year as well along the same lines as to what I believe now um, you know we can't be dogmatic about this sort of thing. No man knows exactly when this is all going to happen, but he, he believes that to be the case as well. And he gives various reasons in his What on Earth book as well as it relates to uh, when the Lord will return. And so I uh, hope you uh, enjoy this and appreciate it. It's a couple years old. Uh, forgive the production quality, uh, but um, I should do it again. Uh, but anyways, enjoy it. And hopefully, hopefully it's useful um, to all the new folks who haven't uh, watched this series yet. If you want to watch the series, you can go back and, and look through my uh, video history and there's a whole like I say series uh, I think I don't know how many I think there's uh, maybe nine videos uh, uh, going through this this uh, book uh, from Ken Owen so thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you guys in the next video Good day, folks everything new in the sun we're going to take a look at um, well we're going to continue in our look at Ken Hovind's what on earth for heaven's sake book which looks at uh, eschatology end time bible prophecy uh, from uh, Ken Hovind's perspective if you will or understanding and he is post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture so he's not a pre-trib guy he used to believe pre-trib for 40 years he doesn't now um and we left off part two so check out the, the uh, what on earth series there's two videos in it already this will be part three and the left uh, the second one we left off talking about uh the temple mount and uh, uh where where it is and uh what what ken thinks about that so we're going to continue on here Speaking of uh, right in the page right after where we left off, uh, he was talking about the Eastern Gate there and uh, went into a little bit of history about the Eastern Gate. So, continuing on, Jesus knew that they could have known the exact date was coming had they read their Bibles. The Jews could have known the exact date of, uh, of uh, their Messiah, Jesus. And when he came the first time, uh, God told Daniel to write uh, it would be 69 weeks or 483 years. Jesus rode into Jerusalem and cried over the city that very day. But of course, he was, uh, he was of course, the, the lamb um, uh, slain for the foundations of the earth, slain for all of us. Um, Jesus rode into Jerusalem and cried uh, over the city on that very day. By the same token, we can know when he will return once the treaty is made or when the abomination of desolation is set up, Daniel 9.27. Interestingly, yes, I, I, I agree. Many people say we don't know the, the day or the hour. But I think we are uh, know we can know pretty closely. We don't know the day, and we don't know the hour. It doesn't mean we don't know the week it happens in, or the the month, or the year, or uh, any other number of uh, time reckoning ways. The Bible specifically states states we don't know the day or the hour, and um, uh, we know that the more literally you take the Bible, often that ends up being the truth. Um, and so they knew, uh, basically, they knew the exact day, actually, Jesus would come, because uh, they knew when their, when their, uh, their Passover was going to be. And they knew when all these, these holidays, these holy days, that's where holidays come from, holy days, um, they knew when these were going to occur. And God had told them uh, in Daniel uh, to write when Jesus was going to return uh, or come the first time. So, yes, I, th I think we can uh, know uh pretty interestingly uh fairly closely and it looks like it could be very well the feast of trumpets which is known as the the holy day 
where no man knows the day or the hour because the, the new moon uh, can happen over two different days. So literally, um, they don't know when the feast is going to start, when, when the new moon arrives. They have two witnesses, which is another biblically prophetic thing. Two witnesses have to confirm um, the new moon. And, uh, and it could happen over a period of two, uh, about 48 hours. So literally, quite literally, no man knows the day or the hour, and the two witnesses will have to decide uh, when that is. <clears throat> the location of the eastern gate is critical to the location of the future temple. Now this kind of goes against um, uh, my other video where I looked at um, uh, the city of David, the temple existing outside uh, of, the, of the walls there in the city of David uh, in relation to the eastern uh, gate. <clears throat> but... Uh, we don't know, and uh, and it's it very well could be that they uh, build the temple in a different place than it was anyways, originally. Um, uh, that can happen as well. We don't know, simply, until that day occurs. The Jewish Mishnah Torah says all the walls which, uh, which were there were high, except the wall in the east, so that the priest uh, who burned the heifer, standing on top of the Mount of Olives, and directing himself to look uh, through... Uh, and directed himself to look, saw through the gateway of the sanctuary at the time when he sprinkled the blood, Mishnah Midat 2.4. One source I read, uh, Kent read, said uh, there have been nine times in Jewish history history where the ref, red heifer uh, was sacrificed. I've been told uh, that the Jews have a small herd of red heifers today in preparation for the new temple. And uh, obviously to note that the uh, templeinstitute.org, a website, templeinstitute.org, has all the implements, has all the priests trained, has, has the golden crown, has all the uh, uh, tools they need to perform the sacrifices. So they're ready to go. The Mount of Olives, about a mile uh, due east of the gate, is 100 feet higher than the city. And as mentioned many times in the Bible, it is about 2 miles uh, long, north to south. It is 15 miles west of the Dead Sea. Jesus will descend on this very mountain, causing the mountain to split. And he, so he goes through the the, uh, the passage in uh, Zechariah. And, uh, Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah. And it shall come to pass that light shall not uh, be clear nor dark, but it shall be uh, one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass uh, that in evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day, and the living water shall go uh, out from Jerusalem. And so interesting um, time references uh, there. It's not it's not the daytime, it's not nighttime. Uh, it's basically dusk. Interesting. So it, it even narrows down from a day period of time. It even narrows it down uh, as to when this will occur. Maybe this will uncap the original spring, Genesis 2.10, from the Garden of Eden and make a new Suez Canal from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Maybe this is part of the prophecy of making the Dead Sea come to life. And also there's a canal that they're talking about um, uh, to uh, provide the Dead Sea water. And uh, that's something they're uh, technologically they're thinking of doing. Ezekiel said the waters of the Dead Sea will be healed. Ezekiel 47, 8. Um, and he goes into more of that. Ezekiel 47, 8 says... Then said he unto me, These waters issue out, out toward the east country, and go in uh, into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. Um, so he goes on, Standing on the top of the uh, Mount of Olives, and looking over the closed eastern gate today, lines up with the empty spot, 50 yards north of the Dome of the Rock. There is easily enough room to put a temple right here, or right there, this will put the new temple where many think the Ark of the Covenant originally rested on even Shatiyah, um, the foundation stone at the base of the Dome of Tablets, a tiny dome visible north of the mosque. Uh, it is only my guess, but I suspect the covenant mentioned in Daniel 9.27 will say something like this. We Muslims will graciously give uh, Jews, you Jews 10 to 15 acres north of the Dome of the Rock, um, so that you can build your temple. In exchange, we want the entire West Bank, the Golan Heights, and $250 gazillion. That's, that's Kent's idea. This will be the most expensive piece of real estate on earth. Jer Jerusalem has certainly become a burdensome stone. So this map here shows um, the lake that will be formed if the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley are filled up 
to sea level. So that's that's how big a lake uh, uh, would be if if it was filled up sea level. No one knows yet, but Daniel, but this Daniel 9:27 covenant will most likely uh, work out the kinks to this problem and let the temple be built. So again, interesting speculation there that, and I've heard it many times before um, that they would build it uh, north. Uh, of the Dome of the Rock there. There is a land unoccupied there that isn't, you know, specifically uh, uh, significant to to Muslims and that could very well be used. The Jews at the Temple Institute in Jerusalem have everything ready to build uh, once permission is obtained and they already have a, a, a temporary structure ready to put up as soon as they have the permission, basically. We cover a little bit of this in the Creation Seminar Part 7. We'll see how it works out. At any rate, 4A um, is that treaty that starts um, the 70th week. So he's talking about the, the uh, graphics we were looking at before. Let's see if we can uh, find that graphic. 4A. Probably should have went the other way. So 4A is right here, uh, the treaty um, that really kicks off um, the 70th week of Daniel, the seven-year uh, tribulation there. So these pictures show the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley are way below sea level. So you can see kind of sea level here and um, the uh, the Dead Sea and the, the Jordan Valley uh, right there and how far they are below uh, sea level. And and this is how far it drops. You can see the, the elevation drop there. I wonder if I can zoom in on that. That doesn't get much clearer. But anyways, you can see the, so this is kind of the, the Mediterranean, and here's the um, going down to the Dead Sea here. And uh, the elevation drops. So that's an interesting uh, view of that. I suspect that the earthquake that opens the spring under the new temple will not only fill the entire Jordan Valley with fresh water and make the Dead Sea come life again, it will also make it possible for the Jews to dig a canal if the earthquake doesn't do the job for them, and have a new Suez uh, Canal from the southern city of El, uh, Eliat, uh, Elat, right past Jerusalem and on to the Valley of Jezreel to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so there you go. So let's look at the first uh, three and a half years and then get into it uh, a little bit of what um, uh, Kent says here. Several things happen during the seven years of the 70th week of Daniel. It is not always possible to tell if they happen in the first one and a half or the second one and a half. Uh, but here are some things to watch for. So he lists them here. We will see later in Appendix 4E the Day of Christ, evidence that the Day of Christ is a rapture, um, the Day of Christ being uh, post-tribulation. Um, um, <clears throat> On that day the sun and the moon go dark after the tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall, be the, shall the sun be darkened and the moon Will not give her light. Obviously, the first thing to watch for is a new temple being built in Jerusalem. This is the next, uh, well, this isn't the next major time clock thing. Next major uh, stopwatch thing is going to be um, the treaty that's agreed upon. And then, if a temple is built, well, that, that puts it in stone. Uh, you can absolutely uh, start your clocks because the Lord's coming back. Uh, that must be completed in the first three and a half years so that the Antichrist can desolate it in the middle when he breaks the treaty. If the covenant of Daniel 9.27 is done in secret, then just watch for the temple going up. That will be national and international news, I'll add. I can see the headlines now. Jews and Muslims get along. Peace on earth at last. Um, and uh, that's going to last for three and a half years, and that's it. Um, so it's going to be... Uh, uh, people are going to believe it, because they want to believe it. Um, but they don't recognize... They didn't read the end of the Bible. They, they didn't read the end of the book, and to see how the book finishes Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon not give her light. This comes before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Joel 2, 10 to 11. This is where his uh, understanding of rapture doctrine come, comes into effect. And the timing, specifically. Um, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord, Joel 2, 31 and Acts 2, 20. After the sun and the moon go dark, the Lord appears to gather together his children at the rapture. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. He shall send his angels. Uh, they shall gather together his elect, Matthew 24. 
And some people don't agree with this, but I think he makes uh, an interesting case, absolutely. Someone must have written to the Thessalonians saying, The day of Christ is at hand, and signed Paul's name. They were confused. The coming of the Lord is a common theme in both Paul's letters to the church. It is mentioned in every chapter uh, of both letters, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians. The day of Christ is a day of the rapture, as we will see in Appendix 4E, the day of Christ. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, obviously, the rapture, that ye not soon be shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor uh, by letter, as from us. We didn't send any letter like that, that the day of the Christ mentioned earlier is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except the falling away shall come first. And we're going to end with basically talking about the falling away. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Most new versions change the day of Christ to say the day of the Lord. This verse, in this verse, major mistake, says uh, Kent. It is correct in the KJB, the King James Bible. Uh, in Second Thessalonians, Paul clearly said that day, the day of Christ, cannot come unless two things happen. Can one, two, the falling away, and the man of sin is revealed. So those two things. The man of sin would be the Antichrist who is revealed when he breaks the treaty in the 70th, middle of the 70th week. Um, this means that there is a great falling away in the first three and a half years. Um, does peace on earth come and, and, uh, and Christians uh, see no reason for Jesus to return because everybody's made peace? Or all, do all the uh, su only um, Sunday day Christians, um, do they all give up the faith? Remember, Daniel said the Antichrist would prevail against and wear out the saints. Um, and and that, that's probably uh, going to be a great time of persecution. How many of us, me included, how many of us are going to um, um, fall away from the faith because we're uh, seeing persecution and we weren't ready for it? Us in North America are so weak, we aren't ready for persecution. And it's coming. And how many will stand? And uh, um, Not many, I think, are going to stand the persecution. It's going to be a horrible time. Um... So why will people fall away from the faith? The Bible gives us some of the reasons. Matthew 24 gives the events from the beginning of the tribulation uh, up through the rapture. Verse 15 tells about the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. This happens in the middle of the week, the middle of the seven years, when the Antichrist breaks the treaty and sets up the abomination that make it desolate. So we can conclude that the events of Matthew 24, 5 to 14, take place in the first three and a half years. Again, uh, setting the setting the timeline, setting the time factor here, um, starting the clock. Uh, if you put all these events into order, you can kind of understand uh, the process. These events that will cause many to fall away are people claiming to be Christ and deceiving many. That many have come and go already like that. Wars, rumors of wars, discouraging and killing many. Many Christians are being killed around the earth. Uh, uh, many do to ISIS. See, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, those who today preach prosperity gospel, will have a real hard time maintaining their faith when God lets them suffer. Absolutely. That's the North America. So weak. All we're used to is first world problems. Um, you know, we when we don't get to watch the movie we want or the internet goes down. Um, but when real persecution hits us, what's going to happen? When real famine hits us, what are we going to do? Persecution. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Isn't that happening in the liberal uh, world that we live in? Everybody's going politically correct and, and liberal. Peace and love. Don't discriminate against anybody. And um, when the Christians have to stand up and say, look, this is what the Bible says. You know, God said it. I'm not making this up. This is what the Bible says. It will be discriminatory. And we will get persecuted for the name of Christ. That will discourage many, um, he says. Even Elijah got discouraged and wanted to quit when he was being chased by Jezebel. He just uh, stood up 850 false prophets and one wicked woman, wicked woman terrified him. There you go. There are scores of verses uh, about by God's children being persecuted and afflicted. It is not that God wants his children to suffer. He, uh, it is that he wants uh, the heathen to hear the gospel and be saved. If that means letting the heathen... Uh, be mean to us for a short time for which you will greatly reward us heaven uh, that is the great reward and a few uh, more of uh, more of the lost get saved and miss the lake of fire forever well god thinks it's a good trade-off uh, we're going to heaven anyway so if we get killed uh, we count it 
uh, as profit. We count it as uh, blessing um, because we are killed uh, for Christ's name. I mean, uh, whether we die now or in 20 years, we're still going to heaven if you've asked Jesus Christ in your in your heart. So uh, if, if you get persecuted because you shared the gospel, if you saved one person, then your life is absolutely worth that. E is being betrayed. Jesus knows about uh, betrayal really well. Um, Judas, etc. Uh, Paul knew about it very well. False prophets deceiving many. Uh, F there. There were people teaching about uh, teaching things that destroyed the people's faith. In Paul's time, uh, too, like Hamanias and Philetus, I think the teachers of evolution fit in here perfectly, says Kent in this. Uh, absolutely they would. They make many fall away from their faith because people who teach evolution teach that uh, you can't trust your Bible. And so Christians come in and, and uh, growing up and they, and they uh, you know, find out that they can't uh, trust their Bible anymore uh, because evolution says this and God's word said this. And so they don't trust the God of the universe for knowing what to say in his Bible and his uh, inspired word. But they trust man. Who made up a theory about the beginning of the earth and so they can't put these things together and so they trust man instead which is absolutely ridiculous um, but it, it makes people fall away from the faith and uh, gee sin because iniquity shall abound and the love of many will wax cold uh, h the parallel account adds that the de adds detail that brothers shall be brother brother to death and father the son and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death you think having your own family threatening to turn in you in for a reward or for spite or because they think uh, they do you a service to God will cause some to fall away? Absolutely. If your family turns against you, what would you do if you had no one left on earth? Your family is usually the one that sticks close to you. If you don't have your family anymore, are you going to stick closer to God? And the same challenge goes out to me, really. I need to ponder that um, closely. I, the parallel account in Luke 21, covers the first three and a half years and adds the detail, fearful sights and great signs shall there be from the heaven. What if HARP, and he's got a picture of HARP here, high frequency active or auroral research program technology, or something similar, he says, is developed to the point where holograms can be projected in the sky, or even made to speak. How many would be deceived and fall away if a fake Jesus, Buddha, uh, Allah, Muhammad, or Virgin Mary spoke to them from the sky like the Wizards of Oz? J, I believe one major cause of the falling away in three and a half years is going to be the fact that false expectations were not met. There are millions of Christians, especially in America, who believe the Lord will rapture them out before the tribulation. So then if the tribulation starts, the Antichrist is revealed, the seven-year tribulation starts, the, the temple is rebuilt, and the Christians aren't, weren't raptured, and they've been t being taught that their whole lives, how many uh, will fall away from the faith and say, you know what, the church was taught me wrong the whole time. And now this has happened, the rapture is never going to happen, and they fall away. Uh, K. Jeremiah faced um, the same problem. He preached that God had clearly said, while well, pro false prophets of his day said uh, they would not go into captivity, uh, they did lots of uh, mean things to Jeremiah because his message contradicted theirs. Watch the pre-tribbers attack me now, he says. People with itching ears always love to love the one who preaches peace and safety and hate the man of God who preaches the truth and I think I think it's right we don't know absolutely 100 um, percent these end times things many of them many of these things we don't know we won't know until they occur we won't know the timing exactly until they occur and then we'll say and then we'll line up the events and say oh okay I, I probably could have seen that coming but I think we have good idea and I think Kent, like I say makes many good arguments um, against the pre-tribulation rapture very good arguments so L here Second Timothy is a whole chapter devoted to the reasons why uh, believers fall away from the faith. Read slowly. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That means homosexual, gay, lesbian, etc. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, with, without sexual control, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, like those who do yoga, for example. A, whole, a form of spirituality. But it's not based in anything actual. But denying the power thereof. You think that any of that is going on. Im, Im, uh, image it getting much worse, he says. Would you fall away because of any of those? What if there was an open nudity on all TV channels and in every street? 
What if there was open violence with it restraint in your neighborhood, like Lot faced in Sodom? Genesis nineteen four uh, to eleven. This has all happened before. Nothing new under the sun, S U N. Um, and so nothing. We're not doing anything new or fresh. These things are all going to come to pass again. A repeat of like it was in the days of Noah. Paul continues. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but even among men and seducers shall wax worse, deceiving and being deceived. Can you imagine if evil men and seducers got worse? No wonder many shall fall away. Keep in mind, God is not causing any other persecution. The, the world is causing the persecution, falling away or tribulation, he says. Evil men will do that. The New World Order folks have already said they will make uh, food the weapon in the next war. I think uh, they will offer food if... You have a microchip. Uh, the whole Mark of the Beast thing. Um, there's going to be so many. You won't be able to buy or sell. You won't be able to get food or water for your family. So how many are going to fall away and, and renounce Christ uh, because they want to feed their family? What a hard decision it will be for leaders, fathers, parents in that day to say, do I do I get a chip in my right hand or forehead and prolong the life of my children or I do, do I let us all die um, because I don't want to take this mark that the Bible has spoken of? Incredible sobering uh, times we need to be aware of. I think they will offer you food if you have a microchip and submit to their system. Those who refuse will have their head cut off. Revelation 13. Doesn't that sound like uh, Islam? Absolutely it does. God wants the children to prevail, persevere, make it to the end. All the departed saints are a great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12.1, watching us run the race and are cheering for us to hold on. The, uh, to precious promises and make it to the finish line. Many Christians today struggle to keep their heart right uh, with God, with the tiny temptations that surround us, surround them. Jeremiah said, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, uh, wherein thou truest, they weary thee, uh, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? Well, think about that for a few, a few minutes. All right, he's going to go on and talk about uh, uh, wolves in sheep clothing and, and being willing, willingly ignorant. I'm going to stop it there, page 129 uh, for now. Interesting thoughts about the New World Order, where things are heading. The whole cryptocurrency thing, and the things that I've been doing videos about. This is all a precursor. Cashless society, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, uh, digital currencies. Now they're going to put blockchain on a chip uh, on your right, in your right hand or forehead. And you're gonna whatever this whatever the central banks come up with this new cryptocurrency, I I, I believe it's uh, blockchain technology that ends up being the w next world currency, and they're gonna wrap that up uh, in this mark of the beast system. It's not there. It's not mark of the beast yet, um, but it's gonna be that blockchain chain technology is gonna be used for the mark of the beast system. Absolutely, I think we're that close. Um, they could turn it into a mark of the beast technology right now. Blockchain is ready to go. They've got the technology ready to go. Um, I'm sure they have leaders in the wings. Uh, we may know their names already. Um, some suggest the Macron guy. Or uh, maybe Obama will come into the, uh, the limelight again. And maybe he will be interested in being a world uh, leader. And uh, one of those world leaders uh, is going to uh, become, uh, be um, uh, indwelt uh, by Satan. Uh, being take or possessed by Satan. And, um, and he's going to really start moving these things so read the end of your bible they tell you what's going to happen at the end of the world and that's what we're covering here with ken hoven's uh book so again interesting thoughts by kent and uh can you argue it can you biblically argue against the uh post-tribulation pre-wrath rapture he makes some uh, great arguments so hope you enjoyed that hope you found that interesting and uh, we'll continue on next sunday thanks guys and i hope you know jesus christ as your lord and savior he's coming back soon very soon i think and uh so get right with him.